welcome back to the final episode of the Beyond Barriers series with me, Ella B. Now I'm really excited because I really believe I've saved the best for last on this series. And today I am going to be exploring the sport of wheelchair basketball and talking to the one and only Gaz Chowdhury. Gaz is such a lovely man and he is so, so dedicated to his sport. He's moved out to Europe to play wheelchair basketball and has also competed in two Paralympic Games, London and Rio. So I'm talking to him today to find out a little bit more about that and I really hope you enjoy his story. I just want to say guys, thank you so much for watching this whole series. I hope you've enjoyed them and I really hope you've learned even more about disability and disability sport. There are some really amazing stories out there that I really wanted to celebrate, so I hope you've enjoyed listening to them and I will be back again soon for another series, so stay tuned on my YouTube channel and I'll see you then. In the meantime though, just stay safe and enjoy this interview with Gaz Chowdhury. Hey! Hello! Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. We got there finally, sorry, that's all my fault. <laughs> Me too. Finally! Not at all, well thank you so much. Thank you so much for agreeing to it for a start. Sorry. How's things? Not, not bad. Um, yeah. Are you in well, lockdown? Nowhere near as bad as you guys this time. Oh really? Uh, yeah, we've got like local lockdowns. Okay. Uh, and we're allowed to train and stuff. We get like special dispensation as athletes, so you're still allowed to like travel for games and stuff. But it's not too bad to be honest. It's nothing like it was in um, March. That was nuts. Well, you, did you you stayed there for it as well? You didn't come back. Yeah. Here, I was here for the whole lot. It was crazy. It was crazy, yeah. Literally, you really weren't allowed out, were you? No, I literally got the dog the week of the lockdown started. So the only reason I was allowed out was to walk him. That's it. Oh my goodness. Well, at least you had to. At least you could get out fresh air then. Exactly. <laughs> so I always start off with like your early life and okay. try and find out what you were like as a child. And um, so what were you like as a child? Were you sporty? Like, did you... Did you always do every single sport you possibly could? Or was there one sport you loved the most or what? Yeah, I was super sporty. Um, I used to love cricket and I used to love, uh, I did taekwondo and boxing as well. So cricket, taekwondo, boxing were my main sports. I sucked at football. I was always in goal. Um, <laughs> just didn't have good like feet. But I, I, I loved all sport. Like um, sports day was literally like the thing I used to look forward to in school. Um, so yeah, super sporty, um, loved uh, cricket, loved fighting, loved like taekwondo, karate, boxing, kickboxing, all that kind of stuff. Um, until you I wouldn't want to mess with you then. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I loved it actually. I remember I, one of my like fondest memories is still we went to this um, taekwondo competition as a kid and I still remember like breaking the boards with like a front kick and that's still one of my like you know when you're a kid I don't know when you're a kid it's one of your like proudest moments I still remember like feeling how good I felt. I feel proper powerful like yeah. <laughs> and I remember like uh, I actually won um, like my weight category um, like like spar or whatever fighting or whatever it was but I remember getting like really beat up in the semi-final and thinking I'd lost and when I'd won, I was like, I, that was, I think that was the first taste of like me feeling like I overcame something. And I must have been like seven or eight, I think. But yeah, I remember like loving sport from a young age. The first taste of winning. Yeah, and, exactly. and with that, were you competitive growing up? Did you always want to win? Like even family games, did you want to win? Yeah, like, ter like terribly competitive, terrible spoil sport. Like there's a video of my um, older sister, she's four years older than me. Um, and it was her birthday and we were playing like pass the parcel. And like, I got knocked out and me just refusing to like throwing a massive tantrum, like, <laughs> yeah, like just not, not having it, not, not letting anyone else win. Terrible, terrible. I have to I was, admit, I think I was similar. Home. Yeah, and I'll definitely be one of those kids. Like I'll take my ball and go home. <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is my game and i'm gonna win it <laughs> exactly. um so how old were you and what happened when you lost your leg right so i was 10 um i got diagnosed with osteosarcoma mm -hmm. uh, which was type of bone cancer um uh, in my right leg and again it was sport it's crazy but it, i remember being sports day or some sort of sporting event 
And um, I remember like the gun, I was in the 100 meter race and the gun going and like I went to go and nothing happened. Like I, I was just delayed and then yeah. I ran and then like, I, I think I came last and I was like, I couldn't really, I didn't know why I, I wasn't the slowest. Um, anyway, uh, and then like my knee just swelled up like crazy. Um, and I remember going to the doctor and as soon as he saw it, he was like, send him, send him for an x-ray. I think he pretty much knew straight away. Um, but yeah, it was, I probably had like pain in my knee for a, a year or two before, but um, they just thought it was like growing pains and yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. wouldn't have had any reason to know, really. No, exactly. It's so rare as well. So um, it, yeah, uh, and I was 10. Uh, yeah, and then a load of chemo, amputation, load of chemo after that. Um, yeah, that was basically how I lost my leg. And did that really then affect you playing sport after that, or did you try and still do everything you were doing? Yeah, I did. Um, again, it was a whole, you know, new world, really. Um, I mean, I swam, which is probably the most typical of sport. That I, could, I still felt like I, I was still me. Mm -hmm. uh, until I discovered wheelchair basketball, that was kind of the sport that I took to, because um, I could still pretty much swim like I used to. Yes. Uh, so that was cool. Uh, but then once I discovered wheelchair basketball, um, yeah, that that kind of captured me straight away. And how how did you discover wheelchair basketball? That's the best question. Though. Yeah, was, you know what? It was um, there used to be a. I've said this before, but there was a wheelchair basketball road show that used to be run. And I, I still don't know if they run it anymore. Uh, and it was run by a guy called Gordon Perry. Oh, that's how I first tried it. There we go, Gordon Perry. Uh, there's a lot of us, I think. You know, there's probably a tons of us. There's a lot of us. Uh, Gordon Perry, I think you know there's probably tons of us that discovered it um, for the first time. But anyway, I went to that, completely loved it. Um, and then I discovered my local club, which was Force at the time, uh, which is run by Ian Laker. Um, and yeah, I went there on a Tuesday. I think it was in Heston. Um, and yeah, it was, it was just just incredible, just incredible. Um, and yeah, I never looked back again. It was it was it, it was everything all of a sudden again. Like sport, yeah, it g gave me back sport. I think. Did you were you always drawn to like the team aspect of it, or did you like um, just the violence of it? What was it that really attracted you? I don't think it was a team. I think the first thing that I loved about it was um, being like, you know, just a typical kind of 10 year old boy running, jumping. You have all these like degrees of freedom and movement. And yeah. I hadn't had that on like, I'd had that in the water when I started swimming again. And I think mm -hmm. that's probably why I like swimming. Um, but I hadn't felt like that on ground since I lost my leg like so I was learning to use the prosthetic I was kind of using crutches sometimes sometimes a day chair sometimes a prosthetic which wasn't perfect um so I was kind of cumbersome on on the ground yeah uh, you know when you've got crutches you can move around but you can't carry anything you know all that kind of stuff so yeah. I remember getting in the wheelchair for the first time like a basketball wheelchair and just like feeling free again and I think that that's what drew me like the freedom yeah. and then just seeing um just seeing like straight i i was really lucky because like really early on i just got to see the game at like the highest level it was being played at at yeah. that end. so i straight away got to see like these paralympians um like literally my first session yeah you uh, were surrounded by like Sinclair Thomas and, and Adi as well and yeah, that's, that's insane to be to be going into a club like that and then watching all them and your first go that's really exciting <laughs> and I didn't realize like what journey it takes to get there or anything like that or what this looks like but I just saw it as like this is the sport do you know what I mean um and it wasn't just them like there was all these guys that were kind of on the periphery of the GB team some guys that made like Jig who made the world championship team there was mm -hmm. Uh, Jamie Hamilton, Ian Laker, who'd been, you know, in years past part of the GB team, Joe Gilbert as well. Um, so the, all these like great players um, and great athletes and some great athletes, current athletes, current Paralympians at the time. And it just, yeah, I was being inspired in a way without even knowing, you know, like it, it seemed like a real sport straight away. It didn't seem like all these people seem to me to 
happened to have a disability. Do you know what I mean? It was like yeah. almost the least interesting thing about everyone at the club. Yeah, yeah, uh, there's way to it than that. Do you know what I mean? And that mm -hmm. that was inspiring to the 12 year old me, I think. Um, I think understandably, and really yeah. exciting as well. It's quite a buzzy sport. So when it's played at the high level, then yeah. there's a lot going on and it's so fast paced that you don't really have time to think about anything else, which is quite nice. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So before we go into even further, I think it's, um, could you possibly explain a little bit about the classification system in the best, simplest form and what classification you fit into then at that point? Right, so I didn't know anything about classification when I first came in, right? So I don't think I knew anything about classification for the first two years. I didn't understand any of it. Um, in fact, I remember having a conversation with and this is going back like 25, well, nearly 25 years, 24 years, 23 years. And Adam Young, um, who represented GB at the junior level, he's a one. Um, I believe he has cerebral palsy. I believe, I don't know. But he's a, and, he, and he's been involved again with the Titans junior team for a long time. And I remember having a conversation with him and he was probably like five years older than us kids. So he was the kind of wise child, like kid amongst us. He yeah. must have been like 15 and we were all like 13 and 14. Um, anyway, and he was like, he asked me what my classification was. And I was like, what do you mean? It's like, what's your points? And I was like, I don't know. What are you? And he goes, oh, I'm a one. So I said, oh, well, you're way better than me. So I can't be a one at that point. <laughs> it was like a second session or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, and, and classification just didn't come up. It just didn't come up till I remember the first time I remembered classification coming up was the fact that I'm a four, but when you're, I think, under 16 or under 18, even still today in England, you get a point deducted. So you play as a three-point player. Um, and I remember when I was, when I played up in the Premier team at that time, um, I played as a three. And that was an advantage. Uh, so the classification works, you go from one all the way up to 4.5 in half-point increments. Uh, the, the lower your point classification, uh, the more, more severe in context of the sport, your disability. So mm -hmm. in principle, um, in, in principle, you're only allowed, you're only classifiable if you have a lower limb disability. Um, so in the, the more of your lower part of your body is affected in principle at the start, the lower your classification will be. So a paraplegic who is a complete paraplegic from say sort of you know no core whatsoever maybe a one uh someone who is an incomplete paraplegic maybe just from the waist down maybe a 2.5 all the way up to a below knee amputee being a 4.5 and i'm an above knee amputee so i sit as a four um and the five players on court can only make up 14 internationally and at club level 14 and a half um and a lot of people don't realize that as well because that makes it a lot more technical and it means you can't put like five four points on or or so on really you can't exceed the points which makes it well for me i'm a one pointer so actually it gives people like me more of a chance to be involved in the sport as well which is exciting and we're like we're like the different ends of the scale us too so it's quite yeah, nice yeah we are we really are and i think like I'm, I'm, I've always thought about this especially now and and, and something that's happened to our sport is that because of kind of it, it happens in every sport as it develops kind of specialization, I feel like the, the ends kind of, you know, you lose sight of it. And I, and I always do wonder what we can do um, from, a, from a perspective of grassroots and club level to encourage more low point players like yourself. Because um, I think it's, it takes longer to develop a low point player uh, yeah. than it does a high point player. Um, and a lot of people don't have the kind of, uh, not, not because they don't want to, but they don't necessarily, a lot of clubs may not have the patience or the ability to develop a low point player. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think there's ways of weighting the classification differently, um, especially in lower leagues to kind of balance that out and make it a fairer sport, I think. Um, so moving on to your GB career, I think I'm going to start with this. How, how did you then um, get involved with GB and were you spotted? Were you asked invitation or you asked to come to a camp? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it was, so I could, at the time when I was, I was developing, um, there wasn't really scope to study and be involved with the men's team. It was, it was always, it was all kind of all or nothing approach at the time. Um, 
So when I was involved with the GB junior team since uh, I think when I was 15 or 16, I made the men. Uh, the no, it wasn't the men's. It was a mixed team, actually. But there just wasn't any girls on the team at the time. So there were no female players. But um, the under-23 teams in 16, maybe, 15, 16. Um, and then it's always kind of the natural progression that once you're in the under-23 setup, you're kind of will be um, spotted and in, invited up to a men's camp. And I was never able to go um, just because I knew the kind of commitment it would require and I just wasn't um, willing to do that at the time. So my first men's proper camp was once I uh, graduated from uni. So I was 22. Um, and, I'd, and I'd always been invited to these men's camps. So it was... Uh, I was really lucky in that sense that there was a kind of open invitation or a new coach came in, um, uh, Murray Tressida, uh, and he had his like first camp where he invited, I think the entire country, whoever wanted to go. And then following that, um, I got invited back. What was your degree in? Uh, political science. Oh my goodness, intense. <laughs> Very clever. Um, was different. I was a child of 9-11. That's what that's what happened. So, you know, it's early 2000s. The world is like, what, what's going on? Um, and, and it just seemed like a relevant thing to study at the time. So what, what year was it when you made your um, men's GB debut then, your senior team? So, debut? I made, I, in, so, so my first ever tournament for the GB team was we went to, I think we went to Israel and I think it was in 2007 or 8. But my first like of a recognized tournament would be the Paralympic World Cup in 2009. Uh, yeah, and I went to some like friendly tournaments in 08. I think I went to one in 07 maybe, like against the Dutch team or something. Um, and then 09 and then 2010 is when I made my debut at the World Championships for GB. That's mad, you've got like like 12 years experience in the GB team. That's insane. Uh, yeah. And it and doesn't feel like that. Next year, if we're going like just by technical years, it'll be my third decade in the men's team. Next yeah, year. that's crazy. Yeah. And yeah. so exciting. God, and you're still so young. You can still go for ages, yeah? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty old. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> uh, you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. holding on. Um, I'm actually now the oldest. It was funny. I'm actually the oldest player in my club team now, which is really weird. Really, really, really weird. Because um, I remember being the youngest player in the GB team. Yeah. Like it was so it, it's kind of crazy that I'm the oldest guy on the team. But you're the wise one too then. <laughs> 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 okay, so then you, you got then selected for London in 2012 for your very first Paralympics. Um, yeah. But also to be selected for a London Games, home games, for your first Paralympics. How exciting was that? You know, it was it was amazing because I, I was in contention for Beijing um, and I was one of the reserves, so I didn't make Beijing. Um, but even while the Beijing stuff was going on, London had just been announced, I think, the year before. So mm -hmm. London was still the, the big spectre and it took so long to come. And it was so hyped up. Like, I, I don't think, it was almost like, you know, like a movie that you've been looking forward to for so long um, that you, when you first watch it, you don't actually appreciate it for what yeah. it, do you know what I mean? You built it up so much. Um, and it's only on reflection that you can kind of start to see, you know, just how special it was. And I think for me, the, it wasn't until I went to Rio that I really appreciated London as well. Was it all just a bit of like a whirlwind that you just came and went, really, because you were just in it? In some ways, and in some ways, it was my first game, and it was a home game, so everything felt like this is just what it's supposed to be. Mm. Um, it felt a little bit less special, because when we went into the village, it wasn't a foreign country, like we flew into. <laughs> it was like round the corner, like, and at yeah. that time, London hadn't been developed, so I was like, I'm in Stratford, like. Yeah, it's just Stratford. <laughs> <laughs> cool like it is now do you know what i mean so it was like we're just going to stratford and the madness was like one of my best friends from school uh was getting married on the day that we went into the village so i couldn't go to the wedding Aww. but we drove past where he was having the reception the hotel 
as like yeah so that was weird so i could have literally walked, temptation yeah, yeah I, could have walked there. I could have walked there um and, and even from little things like where i'd parked the car like to go into the village was like close enough to walk from the olympic village it was really weird it was it was uh um there was nothing normal about it and it's only because i went to rio that i really get just how like ridiculous at home games is like and not just the home game, like in this like my city um it was amazing it actually really really was amazing yeah and the, well the crowd's amazing because wheelchair basketball is a popular sport so you had good crowds yeah we did and i think the the i don't and again i don't know for sure if this is the first time but the games one of the disappointing things about the crowd situation was that obviously like i had all all of my friends and everyone else wanted to come to the games. The games were technically sold out because it was the lottery system and there were all yeah. these corporate tickets, but there were still spaces in the stadiums, but they were sold out. So I, I had friends that couldn't come into the games, even though there were seats. So that yes. was the disappointing part. Um, yeah. But yeah, the crowds were amazing. But again, I think I was spoiled because I thought that's just what a Paralympics is. Um, and someone like Simon Munn, who'd been to Barcelona and then Atlanta and then Athens, and he, and he was like, no, this is not how it is. This is not normal. <laughs> not normal. And I think the only games that I've been told up until that point that even can, came close was Sydney for yeah. people. Um, so London, like, set the bar so high. Um, and as a team, what was your team like for London? Did you have a wealth of experience and was it a bit of a roller coaster ride or um, yeah. did, or did you not realize that until after? <laughs> no, it was it was, it, it, it was a it was a team that was um, definitely older than we are now. Um, we had uh, I think I'm trying to think how many players got their last cap and or like the last tournament that they played in London would have been either not being selected again or retired um, themselves. One, two, I think maybe half the team. That's a lot, that's a lot. Yeah. So yeah, so the, the difference between the 20, I think there was five or six new athletes that came into the team in 2013 European Championships compared to London. Uh, so I think that was kind of the, the last hurrah of that first generation of players that had kind of moved and put GB basketball on the map um, internationally. So I think that was the last remnants of the team that won the silver medal and had medaled in Athens and then had medaled in Beijing. Um, and I think London was the last, a lot of the players, like that was their last tournament there. So home Paralympics is, is a hell of a, hell of a last tournament, I think. So because of that, was there just so much pressure did you feel there was pressure on the team because they wanted to do well because if it was their last tournament and and they'd won bronze in in Beijing as well and yeah and in Athens yeah uh, uh, and we'd had a you know in 2010 the worlds we'd again we'd lost one we lost one game in the quarterfinal ended up fifth after not losing a game the whole tournament um mm -hmm. so we were we really wanted to to remedy that we really wanted to change that i think it was tough i think there was a lot of pressure on a lot of people not just the athletes but i think i think sometimes the pressure isn't on the athletes it's, it's, it's probably with all the kind of incentives around the sport so you know the funding situation the coaching yeah. situation so there's all these things that go into um sport uh that doesn't feature in that that kind of spills over onto the field of play yeah. But it's out of the out of the kind of hands of the athletes, I think. And I think some of that pressure definitely showed. I think that definitely showed for us. And I think um, we, again, I, I don't believe in under or overperforming. I think we ended up where we deserved to be, which was fourth um, in the world that year. Um, but I think I think we definitely had a chance at a medal. And in hindsight, I, I think if we would have medaled, it wouldn't have been. You know, we were a top four team. And I think we could have definitely medaled, mm -hmm. um, whether that be um, whatever color that was. But losing the bronze medal game was tough. It was hard. That, that bronze medal game against the USA was tough. To lose. Yeah. And how was the team after that? I mean, was it just a hard place to be in for a few years or did you all pick up 
quite quickly after then. Yeah, I think it was, it, I mean, it was, it was really tough, like from individuals and everyone dealt with it differently, you know. Um, uh, some people definitely, in, I think we all actually enjoyed the closing ceremony because I think we did feel like it was the end of something. Yeah. Um, so we definitely enjoyed um, the closing ceremony. Uh, I rem yeah, I remember like just 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 how crazy it was. I think Jay Z performed and Rihanna performed, and it was nuts. It was like we were right there. And I was like, yeah. Front row. Like, <laughs> it was a madness. It was an absolute madness. Um, but I think after that, there was the whole period of kind of reflection and and, and the things that. Um, the kind of administrative side of sports goes through, um, you know, piecing together the story, like the forensic story of what happened, um, mm -hmm. of why or why not kind of thing. Um, and then I think we had massive changes, you know, Murray left as a coach. Uh, we had a new coach and we had a new kind of energy into this program because there was such an influx of new athletes as well. And I think everything felt fresh again in 2013 like 2012 was the specter for was for like five to six years it was just there and when it was kind of over everyone could move on um and then put the disappointment of not meddling um, but i think everyone appreciated having had the experience like they were amazed that we had the experience yeah so that next four years was almost like turning over a new leaf starting the fresh and, and so then how was Rio as a game for you? How did you find that? Was it a new experience with all these new players? Did you feel like you, your role changed? As, were you more of a, a role model within the team? Yeah, so like I featured a lot more on, on court in Rio uh, than I did in London. Um, in London, was a, it was a tough one because, um, again, like at the time, you know, being a young athlete, you feel like you deserve to play more, you deserve more minutes, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen. And you don't really have the, and you shouldn't as an athlete, actually, you shouldn't have the perspective to just take a seat back and, um, and just be patient or understand incentive structure better. But um, in Rio, yeah, my role as, a, as an athlete was different. But again, in Rio, we... Rio almost hurts more, even though we won a medal, was that I felt that we definitely had a gold medal winning team in Rio. Um, and losing the semi-final to Spain, and I play in Spain, and I played with some of the guys that were on that team, um, was, I think, one of my, it's missed opportunities. Like, we, and, I, and when I say we, like, I, myself and all the athletes and everything else or everyone else around the sport i think we around the team we definitely let that one get away um and it happens this is i mean that's why you play i mean on uh, spain just seemed to have like lightning in a bottle that day um but yeah that one hurts more than even london does to not play in that gold medal game I remember watching that game, that semi-final, and I've never been so dense in my life. <laughs> we were live in the studio and I was just like, oh my goodness, I can't watch. <laughs> but I need to keep it up with it. <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. And the crazy thing is we'd beaten like Spain by like 30, like yeah. a week before the, before the tournament. Um, and I, it was, it was, it was strange. It was strange. It's one of those games that, it's one of the few games that I played in that I can't recall it like like a like memory wise in terms of what happened. It just all happened as a blur, and it just like it all kind of get away from us. Um, but yeah, it happens. It happens, um, and it's tournament play. I think that's one thing people don't understand is in wheelchair basketball. We, we put, I mean, Paralympics are obviously the pinnacle of our sport, internationally especially. Um, and I hope wheelchair basketball stays in the Paralympics as is, um, because it's a Paralympics, just incredible. Um, but it is a tournament and, and, I've, and, it's, and it's just like all the work can come down to literally the one 40 minutes. Mm. Um, and it's in, you, 
And we're the only sport that starts on day one and finishes on the last day. And you kind of go through this incredible journey for it to just come down to that one game to make a gold medal game or not. Um, and yeah, it, it was tough. I mean, it's still, it's still tough, to be fair. It's sport, isn't it? And uh, sport is on, like, so frustrating sometimes, so unfair. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, it, it, that, that's, that's what makes it so special. That's what makes the Paralympics so special, that you can get, uh, you know, a moment like that for Spain, for Spain, Spanish Paralympics is, is, is incredible. So then how was the feeling in the team going into that bronze medal match then? Did you, did, I mean, with the youngsters on the team, they must have just been really, really fighting for it and really wanting it. Yeah, I think everyone did. I think everyone did that. And also there was, there was the whole backdrop also. The bronze medal game was the last game for Simon Munn. So we started him in that game. He hadn't, he hadn't played much in that tournament. Uh, up until that point, but he started that Turkey game. Um, and we were there or thereabouts, but again, that game was, we, we yeah, we, we definitely did not want to repeat USA. Um, and, and I think it showed, I think it showed in our fight and it showed in our togetherness in that game. So, um, but wheelchair basketball in the UK is not as big as wheelchair basketball in Europe. And you moved out to Europe to play, was it in 2007? I yeah. Remember. Yeah, so that's 2008. 2008. Uh, so, so, so why why did you decide to move out to Europe? What what attracted you to Europe? Well, the first, the biggest reason um, I moved out was it was the only way for me to be a full time athlete. Um, in the UK, you know, there's two options um, to be a full time athlete. Either you make the men's team or the women's team, and you get uh, an APA, which is an athlete. Per uh, personal award which allows you to train full time um, um, it's not wage it's not you know and no one is getting rich up of APAs but it's enough that you can say you know what I'm devoting my life to my sport <laughs> this is what I'm going to do um, at the time the way it was I think it was only the 12 guys that had gone to Beijing that qualified for an APA I, I can't remember the exact bureaucratic stuff so I didn't I wasn't getting any money so I'd taken out so every, all the training that I was doing in the lead up to Beijing was on my own, you know, figuring out part-time job, you know, loans, family helping out, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I had no choice really, um, short of, I don't know, robbing a bank or something um, yeah. to continue to train full time. Um, so I took myself to Europe for that primary reason, first and foremost. Um, and, and it was it was a real blessing because I came back better because I was just able to focus on the sport. Um, and where and did that, you go originally to play? Where was your first team? So I went to Italy to Porto Torres. Um, <laughs> and again, I was lucky. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the 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 most power the, the strongest team or the best team in Europe or anything like that, but. Um, it was the first time that I had like 24 seven access to a basketball court, 24 seven access to a gym. Um, my entire life was built around wheelchair basketball and it was in a, in, in Sardinia, a beautiful place, but in the winter, it's really not nice, right? There's nothing going on in the winter, oh dear. like literally nothing. So like 90% of the restaurants aren't even open because it's yeah. just a summer town. So there was nothing to do. There was no distractions. It was just you know, basketball 24-7. Um, and I loved it. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Europe is the only place that you can get the kind of high-level competition that's exciting. Once, you know, there's, there's very little excitement in... So just, just, just off the bat in the UK, if, if, a full, if an athlete is training full-time and they play against a guy who's not, just by the sheer fact of that, it makes it non-competitive. Yeah. Right. Um, whereas in Europe, you know, every single person you're training against or playing against, rather, is training cool. just as you is full time. Um, yeah. But that raises the standard straight away. Um, but I'm um, kind of speaking to then about COVID and more. How has that affected? Um, firstly, how has it affected your team out in Spain? But also, how has it affected um, your GB team as well? And I'm guessing you guys haven't been able to train at all. Yeah. No, so the season got called like right at the business end, right? So we had like, we just had a King's Cup, which is like the FA Cup final. Um, so we were going into like Champions Cup. We were going into the league final four. Everything just got stopped dead. 
Um, so last season was a wash. And then we were all kind of waiting to see what would happen with Tokyo. Uh, it's slightly fortunate for me because the last week, I'd, so I'd been battling this kind of tear in my TFCC for a long time, uh, kind of held together by tape for ages, but then I ended up tearing my uh, distal ligament as well completely. So my hand, I had to have surgery. So if Tokyo was this year, I would have missed it through injury. So I got lucky that way. This benefited you. Uh, pandemic is a good thing, but silver lining for me personally was that I'm, I could still make Tokyo now next year. Um, but um, yeah, so we started training again from our club perspective uh, in Spain. We're getting COVID tested every week. Um, we, we're trying to create a bubble as much as we can. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we get tested every week. Uh, we're training uh the same uh training is back up the court but again we are um we, some of the things that we're allowed to do like travel to an away game we wouldn't just we you can't do as a civilian at the moment like in lockdown so you yeah. need special organization. so we're just being careful um it, it's almost become the new normal i don't know how you feel but it doesn't feel strange anymore it's been so long um, no, and you're just like, oh, oh, got to take my mask, oh, got to do this. Like, you, you're just automatically doing it now because it's just normal. <laughs> you're right. And I found myself, I was walking the dog this morning, right? And I, um, and I saw this guy and he didn't have a mask on. And I literally like found myself being this like judging old, you're like, like oh, oh. <laughs> what? he's not got a mask. And you're like, I, mask <laughs> exactly, I, I saw myself like walking around like the long way. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? But yeah, it's just not normal. Um, the only thing I mean, I've, I've been fortunate enough, like I've basically decked out my home gym with as much equipment as I can. Um, so stuff like that, really. Uh, if we do go into a hard lockdown to have, you know. Yeah, you still be able to train. Yeah, like what? Yeah, following. Yeah, like following your home workouts. <laughs> um, not sure they're going to be your standards. <laughs> no, I just pick up slightly heavier things. That's about yeah. it. Really. That's yeah, all it is. <laughs> so um, how does that then affect the GB team? Like, is it is it almost a bonus that you've got another year now then to, um, well, you, you're running out of time really to get together again and train if it's not possible at the moment, so. Yeah, so we've got no camp. So normally we have a camp every month. Um, yeah. Looking like we're not going to have a camp till June. So it's going to be weird. Um, the only good thing is we, most of the GB, well, not most, of, but, eight or to eight there's very few gb players that are on their own in a place so there's yeah. the pocket so we're all kind of in mini groups so there's four here at amia there's two at Elunian. there's three at mediba this year there's a couple in a couple other teams um so at least we're getting to do that and at least um we're all still part like we're lucky with our sport that we have that we're still all able to train and play full time the sport that we play the GB. It's just weird that we've not had a camp for so yeah. long, um, and we won't do. So I don't know how. It I mean, selection will be difficult because obviously, um, how do you select the team without having camps? But um, I think, I think there is a there is a positive to it almost. Like it could, you know, because we haven't been together for so long it may just be that we get together after so long and it just clicks beautifully um and that would be the hope i think <laughs> and like without like the, the beauty of the and again this is um it really came across in the another doc that you were the rising phoenix doc that you were involved in as well yeah. it's unbelievable great work by the way nice. uh, it was really fun i loved it <laughs> it was cool it was so cool i was got there was there it, it was like all I heard from wheelchair basketball was there's no wheelchair basketball in it and I was like okay so yeah. you heard that a lot right um yeah. but it really didn't matter like I think it was unbelievable like I was yeah it was unbelievable um, I think what I liked most was it, it was it was um fresher different stories that we never, never haven't really necessarily heard before we weren't focusing on all the main names of the Paralympics we had little unknown people in there too which was good yeah, I, I just I just thought it was great. I thought it was great. And I think it did a, I, I don't know about you, but I remember the big thing was like, it's just going to be like this this giant 
dump of like inspiration porn and it just wasn't it was compelling it was you know it was it, it was layered it wasn't just oh the reality of it yeah exactly mm. it, was, it was just it was awesome but anyway <laughs> um, the thing that jumped out to me was like um just how much of a commercial enterprise it's it is to host the paralympics and yeah. i just want and i just hope like that ultimately the Paralympics, it doesn't come down to the, the kind of whether the dollars make sense or not. That's my yeah. only. Like okay. it is. But yeah, I, I just hope, I, I mean, as an athlete, obviously, you, you want to compete and, and, and get a chance to compete in Tokyo would be amazing. We did a, we did a, um, a couple of trips to Tokyo. It looked amazing. So, uh, yeah. Tokyo is a really cool city. So if they can, I think, I think they will probably do everything they can to make it safe if it's possible. Yeah, I think if any city can do it, it'd be Tokyo. You could pull it out of the bag, but um, yeah. So um, I've, I won't keep you, sorry, one more question. I've got one more question that I won't keep you too long. But, um, I always ask everyone this final question because I think it's, as an athlete, it's really important to unwind and stop and slow down sometimes and just take time for you to chill. Um, so what is your guilty pleasure? What helps you do that? <laughs> it can be anything. It can be like a TV program. It can be food. Whatever you want. <laughs> well, like I don't, I don't know. Like it's not. I've got a few really. I think I'm maybe so wound up that I, I I need more than just one. But like it's not much of a guilty pleasure. But I've had a pretty um, robust meditation practice for a long time. Oh. Uh, which I'm actually on Friday running a session with all BWB members. Hey. Friday, yeah. It should, it, on what? Um, it'll be a Zoom thing. I've just like Ooh. agreed to do it. So okay, I'll have a look out. I'll look out yeah. Um, but yeah, so mindfulness meditation is is been a long standing thing for me, um, and it's definitely helpful, like crazy helpful. Um, I'm I'm fairly boring, you know. Like it's like a guilt time. pleasure. Like I can definitely binge watch like sitcoms i would say that's the one yeah. but like I'm, i'll like um we have these long long like road journeys to games and yeah. i'll download the latest series of this or that and i end up just like cheekily also downloading like i don't know big bang or friends or something and just just well, watching yeah. those yeah terribly just 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 yeah cheesy sitcoms i think i like definitely my guilty pleasure i would love say that. love yeah. that oh good <laughs> oh well, I'm definitely going to look out. I'll look out for Friday and look out for the yeah. um, meditation for sure. That'd be great. Um, and it would be very, maybe I should team up with you. It um, worked very well with my workouts. <laughs> cool. That We should do it. <laughs> Mindfulness Friday and work. Yeah, that would be, I don't workout know. Workout <laughs> Ella, we, we're planning on doing making a cult right now. Like you'll do the physical part. I'll do the, yeah. Oh my god. We'll sort out everyone's lockdown. Oh there you will be a documentary about us on Netflix, either. <laughs> I know directors. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Perfect. No, that's so exciting. And thank you so much for letting me talk to you today. I'm taking that no, too much pleasure. time. And I'll let you get to training for sure. But um, cool. it's been lovely to catch up as well. Yeah. And fingers crossed, we'll see you in Tokyo, <laughs> if not before. Yes. Well, thank awesome. you very much. Have a good training. Thank See you. you soon. Bye. Bye.